Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Today's date is Monday, June 2nd, 2014. And don't worry, FCC, pretty soon this will be banned by you. Here's a look at what's coming up. Tonight, Obama takes undue political risk by negotiating with terrorists and the death of bin Laden revisited. Did you not hear me? May 25th, 2010, Washington Post, the CIA admits that they created fake bin Laden videos. You listen to me, ideas are bulletproof and you cannot stop us. Liberty is rising, the spirit of 1776 is indomitable and you are on my- On today's Alex Jones show, most of the time was spent focusing on the Bo Bergdahl controversy and whether he's a hero or deserter or defector or a CIA asset. And we're going to get to that uh, after this break. But first, we're going to get to the creature that never dies, the one that keeps appearing over and over again. He's everywhere, and he's still the reason we have to give up all our rights. That's right, the return of Osama. And uh, Alex had to put out a directive today that we need to go over all the lies that, that encompass the bin Laden death. So we're going to start with an article that came out May 9th of 2011. This was right after bin Laden was killed, which was May 1st. But first, actually, let's go to the president himself with the first lie of the fable. The death of bin Laden marks the most significant achievement to date in our nation's effort to defeat al-Qaeda. So that was May 1st, 2011. And we produced a slew of articles right after that claiming that it was fake. Uh, Alex Jones went on RT saying the bin Laden fable was a fake, that he was really already dead. And we're going to get to all that information. But first, I want to This is going to be kind of our mainstay article that we're going to build off of. Ten facts that the bin Laden fable is a contrived hoax. This is by Paul Joseph Watson from May 9th, 2011. And we're actually going to start with number two. The official narrative of how the raid unfolded completely collapsed within days of its announcement. First, there had been a 40-minute shootout. Then there was no shootout and just one man armed. First, bin Laden was armed. Then he was not. First, bin Laden used his wife as a human shield. Then he did not. Uh, the compound was described as a $1 million mansion, turned out to be a rubbish-strewn, dilapidated compound that was worth less than a quarter of that. Almost every single aspect of the official narrative has changed since Obama first described the raid on Sunday as the White House struggled to keep its story straight. Now I want to point out an article that we wrote the day after Obama made his announcement. Inside Sources. Bin Laden's corpse has been on ice for nearly a decade, and if you scroll on down to almost the bottom of this article, it lays out a really cool timeline that shows all the different spots where Bin Laden, there were hints out there from different people all over the world that Bin Laden was already dead. It has uh, Benazir Bhutto, President Musharraf, um, even CIA officer Robert Baer, all kinds of people weighing in on the fact that Bin Laden had been killed already. And this is before the announcement made by President Obama on May 1st, 2011. Now, let's go to May 13th, 2011. Narrative behind bin Laden fable flip-flops again. After first claiming the Navy SEALs recorded the entire 40-minute raid of the alleged bin Laden compound live on their head cameras, CIA Director Leon Panetta subsequently backtracked, saying the video feed was cut off when SEALs entered the building. Now the official narrative has been reversed again, claiming the SEALs did, in fact, record the whole episode. So whether they had video or not, was the situation photo staged? Well, in this article, it goes back to this. This led to the accusations that the situation photos were staged, which prompted Hillary Clinton to claim that the dramatic over-the-hand image was, in fact, merely her coughing. Let's take a look at these situation room photos. There she is with her hand over her face. There's Obama and Biden looking on, aghast in horror. And then there's everybody else in America believing the BS fable. And now we go from the death of bin Laden and the firefight that may or may not have took place and the videos that may or may not exist to his burial. It was claimed that he was taken by helicopter to an aircraft carrier out in the ocean and buried at sea. Well, we go to November 22nd, 2012, Kurt Nemo's article, No Sailors Saw Osama Bin Laden's Alleged Burial at Sea. More than a year after Navy SEALs supposedly killed former CIA asset Osama Bin Laden, a Freedom of Information Act by the Associated Press has produced emails revealing that no American sailors aboard the USS Carl Vinton witnessed the terrorist burial at sea. RT had an article that came out earlier that year, uh, back in March. Here's the headline. Leaked. Bin Laden not buried at sea. Body moved on CIA plane to U.S. The, art, uh, the body of al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden was not buried at sea, according to leaked emails of the intelligence firm Stratfor, as revealed by WikiLeaks. So apparently it was bound for Dover, Delaware, and did not bury, see if you believe the myth at all, that they even killed somebody named Osama bin Laden. 
Now, let's go back in time to October 2011. Navy discharging 64 sailors for drug use distribution. The U.S. Navy said on Thursday it was discharging 64 sailors, 49 of them from the aircraft carrier that buried Osama bin Laden at sea. Wow. What are the odds that you're going to have 49 people on the same ship that buried Osama bin Laden that you're going to discharge for supposedly distributing drugs? Do we believe that? Is that a cover story? Who knows? That's for, up for you to decide out there. Of course, we need people out there to do the research into all these different things. Now, let's go back to the article, 10 Facts That Prove the Bin Laden Fable is a Contrived Hoax. And let's look at number six. Almost every single neighbor that lived near the alleged Bin Laden compound in Abbottabad that was interviewed by news reporters said that with absolute certainty they had never seen Bin Laden and they knew of no evidence whatsoever to suggest he had lived there. So you have this million dollar compound, which really isn't a million dollar compound, that he's supposedly been hiding out in for years with his whole family, and yet no one there has ever seen him in Pakistan. And I'm really not even going to get into the CIA uh, cover story of them doing a vaccination program in that same area looking for him. That was just another part of the contrived cover up. Um, but jumping from that article, we go to an article that came out May 9th, 2011 from PrisonPlanet.com. Obama, we cannot definitely say that Bin Laden was there. First paragraph here. During his 60 Minutes interview with CBS last night, Barack Obama admitted that U.S. intelligence was only 55 to 45 percent confident that Bin Laden was even in the compound raided last Sunday night, fearing that the occupant could have actually been a prince from Dubai. A skepticism shared by residents of Abbottabad, one of whom told the BBC that the man watching television in the tapes released by the White House Saturday was in fact his neighbor, not Bin Laden. And here we're going to go to the pictures right here. There's the man with the remote control in his hand. Obviously, that's not Bin Laden, although we were told it is him. So, so far, we've got fake photos. We've got no video. We've got no records from the Pentagon. We've got no burial at sea. We've got no soldiers that witnessed the so-called burial at sea. And then we have those soldiers that didn't witness the burial at sea discharged for supposed drug distribution. Now, what about the SEALs that conducted the raid on May 1st, 2011? Well, here's what happened to a few of them. Fox News reports on August 6, 2011, helicopter crash in Afga Afghanistan reportedly kills members of SEAL Team 6. Insurgent shot down a military helicopter during fighting in eastern Afghanistan, killing 30 Americans, most of them belonging to the same elite unit as the Navy SEALs who killed former al-Qaeda leader Osama bin Laden, U.S. officials said Saturday. It was the deadliest single loss for American forces in a decade-old war against the Taliban. And if you read a little deeper into the article, it talks about that the particular helicopter they were flying was a CH-47F Chinook helicopter, normally the type of helicopter that is reserved for the National Guard which led to a lot of the SEAL Team 6 families coming out and wondering what the heck was going on. In fact, we had a few of them on this show, um, one of which went on to say, well, from the Washington Times, families suspect SEAL Team 6 crash was inside job on worst day in Afghanistan. Uh, every day, Charlie Strange, the father of one of the 30 Americans who died on August 6, 2011, and the flash of a rocket propelled grenade asked himself whether his son Michael was set up by someone inside the Afghan government wanting for revenge for Osama bin Laden killers, SEAL Team 6. Somebody was leaking to the Taliban, said Mr. Strange, whose son intercepted communications as a Navy cryptologist. They knew someone tipped them off. There were guys in a tower, guys in a brush line or a bush line. They were sitting there waiting and they sent our guys right into the middle. Wow, isn't it amazing that the elite team that carried out this attack were then set up by supposedly members in the Afghan government. Is that believable? Or is it more believable that probably they were set up by our own government because, well, there were book deals coming out, there were movies coming out, all of them kind of agreeing that Osama bin Laden was killed, but not agreeing in the way he was killed. And you can look up those articles. There's massive amounts of volumes, amounts of, of information on the movies, the documentaries, the different books that have been out there. It simply just doesn't hold water which is why you have all these different narratives coming out. That's to cloud the whole situation. It keeps everything clouded. So you don't know what's right and what's wrong. All you know is that Osama bin Laden's dead and the president killed him. Those are the only things that are concurrent in the narrative. In fact, we had Mr. Strange on the show, and uh, this prompted another article in July 24, 2013. SEAL Team 6 families forced Congress to investigate mysterious cho chopper crash. 
Led by firebrand rep Jason Chaffetz, Congress is to launch an official investigation into the mysterious helicopter crash that killed several members of Navy SEAL Team 6 in Afghanistan. Back in May, the families of the SEALs went public with their concerns that the Obama administration was at least partially responsible for the attacks on their son. So there, by that time now, they're claiming that, yes, Obama is partly responsible. Before, there was just all these inconsistencies. We had Mr. Strange on the radio show, and I'm going to put a link to that in the video uh, in the description down below, where you can hear him talking about how they saw pictures of his son. They actually, some of the guys actually made it out of the helicopter alive and were fighting, and there was no backup sent to them for a long time. They left him out there to die because dead men tail no tails. That is the bottom line of this all. Those guys were set up and they were murdered, most likely 90% by our own government to cover up this fable of Osama bin Laden. Now, remember when we went to the article that they had bin Laden on ice and they were going to trot him out whenever they need him? Well, here's an article out of The Guardian dated October 31st, 2001. From The Guardian, CIA agent alleged to have met bin Laden in July. This is in 2001, right before September 11th, July 2001. Two months before September 11th, Osama bin Laden flew to Dubai for 10 days of treatment at an American hospital where he was visited by the local CIA agent, according to the French newspaper Le Figaro. Wow, so we had him back then, right before 9-11. We decided not to do anything because he was a CIA agent and his name was Tim Osman. You can look that up too. And then I want to take you to a really long transcript. This is a multi-page transcript that we put out on Jones Report. And this is from the Alex Jones Show dated April 24th, 2002. And you may recognize the name, Dr. Steve Pachinik. We've had him on the show many times, but back in 2002, it was his first appearance on the show. I'm gonna get down here, it's many buried many pages into this. They're talking about all kinds of stuff. There it is, SP, and, and, and Alex is asking him about the fat bin Laden. And he says, well, it's not a good situation, but it basically says to me that this is an orchestrated type of war, and I think that I didn't want to believe it for a very long time. And then I said that somebody is orchestrating something here with the agreement of the bin Laden family knowing full well that he would die. And I think that Musharraf, the president of Pakistan, spilled the beans by accident three months ago when he said that bin Laden was dead because his kidney dialysis machines were destroyed in eastern Afghanistan. Well, he was one of the few that knew he had a kidney problem. That wasn't well known before. Everybody thought he had heart disease. Well, he also had Marfan syndrome, uh, another disease which does give you heart problems and also gives you weird shoulders and makes you abnormally tall, kind of like what bin Laden was. It was the same disease Abraham Lincoln had. And it also leads to people having short lifespans. So let me tell you, bin Laden was dead well before 2011. There's even videos out there of Benazir Bhutto naming the man who killed bin Laden, and she was killed in 2007. So it's been out there. It's out there many different ways. It's a big fable, and I hope this video, with all the documents and links that we're putting out at the bottom, lets you tell all your other naysayer, trendy friends, and say, well, we killed him. Obama killed bin Laden. No, he didn't kill bin Laden. Bin Laden was dead a long time ago. Let me tell you, this information may not be around on the internet for long. With the FCC ramping up, in fact, they even got to our magazine. They're trying to ban our magazine that's out there right now. Uh, InfoWars magazine this month focuses on the death of the internet and what's going to happen when they decide to take away the free internet, which we have now, and replace it with a new internet, one that you have to pay for to have your site listed, one that sites like InfoWars aren't going to get the same treatment. Even though we don't even get the same treatment now, we're not listed on most news sources, even though we break a lot of stories. We're not listed on those because the powers that be do not want the truth out there. So you have to go get your uh, copy here this month, Death of the Internet, the InfoWars magazine. It's got all kinds of articles talking about why the Internet's going to be taken away and how they're going to do it. It's not just going to be they're going to cut off the Internet. They're going to set up rules and say we're going to have people analyzing different things. And if you're not giving you know, full treatment to all sides of the story, well, we're going to have to get rid of you or you're going to be put on a second tier status. They're going to do this and it's all going to be done incrementally. So there's the back cover banned by the FCC. Warning, this publication has not been approved by the Federal Communications Commission. Please put it down or return it to your local authorities. Thank you for your cooperation. There's your little warning there from the FCC talking about InfoWars magazine. That's this month's edition. You can get a subscription. You can get this issue. You can get multi-issues. You can become a distributor of the magazine, even sell them yourself in your own place of business, or just hand them out to people to wake people up.
So pick up this month's edition of the InfoWars Magazine, June 2014. It talks about the death of the internet. Don't let people sucker you into believing that Obama killed Osama because that's not how it happened. And uh, we'll be right back after this break with a big update on the Bo Bergdahl situation. Stay tuned. It's InfoWars Nightly News. Welcome back to the InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Um, I just, over the break, I was thinking about this. Really do encourage you to pick up this month's subscription to the InfoWars magazine. It talks about the death of the internet and why someday when you wake up, it may not be the same internet that you used to know, the internet that you grew up with, uh, the internet that's been with you from the beginning. It will be a different type of cold, hard, meaner internet that doesn't let you search for information like you used to. Now, moving on. Today on the Alex Jones Show, uh, Alex and J Staff Sergeant Joe Biggs, Leanne McAdoo, even Steve Pachinik got in on the um, Bo Bergdahl situation. Is he a hero? Is he a deserter, as it was said on the Drudge Report today? Well, I'm just going to go over four clips, and then we have a report at the end from Leanne McAdoo um, about this situation and kind of all the different facets in it. The first one's from Alex, talking about why he thinks this doesn't really add up. Three days after the White House inadvertently blew the cover, yeah, right, of the CIA's top officer in Kabul, President Obama on Wednesday, said his administration is committed to effective intelligence gathering and protecting sources and methods abroad. <clears throat> and again, not that this story in and of itself is that important unless you use it to learn how things really work. And a first approximation of this, looking at it this weekend, the Bo Bergdahl uh, Army story, who's been in captivity for almost five years, supposedly, looks like an infiltration operation where you purposefully claim you've defected to the Taliban and then they don't trust you, they grab you and then you're a quasi-prisoner and then you act like you've got Stockholm Syndrome and that you basically uh, join them and then you have the dad with his Twitter uh, reportedly and it looks like it's his real Twitter, it's not verified but it's been operating for years saying, you know, we, you know people will pay for the death of Afghan children and uh, growing a big beard and all the rest of it. Uh, the whole thing stinks to high heaven. All right, and this next clip has got Joe Biggs talking about how he thinks he wasn't captured as what the official narrative is and that he actually walked off base because he had been talking about it before in his writings, uh, in confidence with other people, and here's that clip. He walked off the base and didn't even think, all right, I'm gonna get my head chopped off. The Haqqani Network is known as the Sopranos of Afghanistan. This next clip deals with the father, who is a 20 plus year veteran of the Postal Service and decided to learn to speak Pashtun. Uh, Joe talks about how when he goes into his accent, the things that he saw that a lot of other people who have not been to Afghanistan probably wouldn't even notice. Well, the, the funny thing though is about his father. He is a US Postal Service worker and had been for 20 something years. The fact that he speaks Pashtun in a very perfect dialect I don't know many people in Idaho who probably speak Pashtun, but I think it's kind of odd that this man speaks it to the T. I mean, just his, the way he sounded, the way he said everything was spot on from what I heard when I was in Afghanistan. So I think there's a little what something behind him. In this last clip from today's show, which I encourage you to go watch the entire exchange between Alex and Joe and their investigation into this matter, uh, talks about a tweet that was deleted off of Bo Bergdahl's dad's uh, Twitter account. When I got uh, when I got to Bob uh, Bergdahl's account, the Twitter account, I saw that tweet, and I saw it right before it got deleted. He says, "I'm still working to free all Guantanamo prisoners. God will repay for the death of every Afghan child." Amen. Well, Bo's father is supposed to be a devout Christian, so the fact that he misspells "Amen," I found that to be a little weird too, as well. But immediately they took that tweet down. And I find that, you know, that's, that in itself right there is a little shady too. So once again, I encourage you to go check out the full uh, show today and you can see for yourself all the questions that we're asking that aren't being asked by the mainstream media. Uh, we're gonna go to a, a final short report here from Leanne McAdoo and she's detailing the people that are going to be released from this prisoner exchange swap that was done with Obama and Mr. Bo Bergdahl. Obama was willing to pay a steep price in exchange for Army Sergeant Bo Bergdahl. The Guantanamo Five are top Taliban commanders, and the group has tried to free them for more than a decade. 
According to a 2008 Pentagon dossier on Guantanamo Bay inmates, it was disclosed by WikiLeaks, all five men released were considered to be a high risk to launch attacks against the U.S. and its allies if they were liberated. Mullah Mohammed Fazl is Taliban's former deputy defense minister and is wanted by the United Nations for his role in massacres targeting Afghans' Shiite Muslim population. Mullah Narula Nori was a senior Taliban military figure directly subordinate to Taliban's supreme leader, Mullah Amar. Nori led troops against U.S. and coalition forces and is also wanted by the U.N. for possible war crimes, including the murder of thousands of Shiites. Abdul Haq Wasik is a former deputy minister of intelligence. At one point, he tried to cooperate with U.S. forces in Afghanistan, asking for a GPS system as well as a special radio to communicate with the U.S. military after the invasion in 2001. His dossier says that while he was deputy intelligence minister, he was a crucial liaison between the Taliban and other Islamic fundamentalist groups. Mohammed Nabi Omari held several military leadership posts for the Taliban. He helped organize the al-Qaeda and Taliban militias that fought against U.S. and coalition troops in the first year of the war. Nabi maintained weapons caches and supported extremist activities by smuggling fighters and weapons. Nabi maintains strong ties to active networks. Khair Ula Karikwa a former Taliban governor of Herat was considered by the Pentagon's 2008 dossier to be a likely heroin trafficker and a major opium drug lord in western Afghanistan. And he likely participated in meetings with Iranian officials after 9-11 to help plot attacks on U.S. forces. The dossier says the detainee claimed to be a longtime friend of Afghanistan's president, Hamid Karzai. According to AfghanistanAnalysts.org, Karikwa is the most senior of the five on the list. He is one of the fraternity of original Taliban who launched the movement in 1994. In other words, he is someone who will still command a great deal of influence and respect among today's insurgents. This week's secret diplomacy was not the first time the U.S. government has engaged the Taliban in an effort to negotiate a prisoner swap for Bergdahl's release. In 2011, State Department officials held a series of meetings with Taliban leaders in Doha. At the time, Dianne Feinstein opposed the swap, saying, These are major Taliban figures. They are not minor people, and they will not be held in maximum security custody. Forget that it won't be Guantanamo, just maximum security custody. And in my view, there's no way of knowing what they may do and what kind of propaganda they may breed. Lawmakers suspected the released Taliban could eventually end up returning to the fight. So what has changed in the last few years? The United States just announced it's winding down the war in Afghanistan to concentrate on emerging terrorist threats elsewhere. The sudden release of these Taliban commanders now will end up replenishing the diminished leadership ranks of the Afghan Taliban. So there you go. It looks like the Taliban are going to be getting some of the worst of the worst back in their ranks and we get one soldier who may or may not have deserted. I'm not saying we know the full answer right now, but we're definitely asking questions that nobody else is gonna ask. We're gonna go to another report here from Jakari Jackson that talks about the uh, references to abortion in the Bible, and then when we come back from break, we're gonna have Joe Biggs sitting down with a neighbor. He's gonna be talking via video Skype with the neighbor of the Bergdals. Stay tuned, it's InfoWars Nightly News. Planned Parenthood has reached a new low. A report has surfaced pointing out that Planned Parenthood says that the Bible actually supports abortion. A letter addressed to clergy reads, Many people wrongfully assume that all religious leaders disapprove of abortion. The truth is that abortion is not even mentioned in Scripture. Well, on the flip side of that same coin, the Bible doesn't specifically mention using an automobile to mow down innocent pedestrians because you're a sex-deprived sociopath. But even the most devout atheists can see that such an action is not justifiable. More to the point, the Bible includes a section called the Ten Commandments. Maybe you've heard of this. One which reads, Thou shall not kill. Some translations say, Thou shall not murder. Either or would apply to abortion. People skeptical of the Bible will point out that there is plenty of violence in its pages, which is true. King David, who probably single-handedly killed the most people in the Bible, lived a life of constant warfare. But if you recall, David's campaign started when Goliath came to kill his people. So in self-defense, not murder of convenience, David slew Goliath and waged war against the Philistines. 
With that said, Planned Parenthood, whose current president says her children's lives began when she gave birth. When do you think life starts? Yeah. Well, I don't know if it's controversial. I don't mm -hmm. know that it's really relevant to relevant to the to the conversation. But I mean, okay. for me, I'm a mother of three children. Um, mm -hmm. For me, life began when I delivered them. Um, they were part of. They they've been probably the most important thing in my life ever since. Mm -hmm. But that was my own personal. That's my own personal decision. Planned Parenthood, formerly the American Birth Control League, founded by Margaret Sanger, whose hobbies included long walks in the park, accompanied by the Klan. That Planned Parenthood is now saying that it is the will of Almighty God that you murder your child in the womb. Even though the scriptures clearly read, Keep thee far from a false matter, and the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. But Jesus said, Suffer little children, and forbid them not to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Cursed be he that taketh reward to slay an innocent person, and all the people shall say, Amen. This is clearly another attack on the word of God, providing itching ears with the doctrine they so desperately want to hear. You can find more reports at Infowars.com. All right, I'm joined tonight with uh, Susan. She is a friend of the Bergdahl family. She knew both parents and the son as well. Susan, how did you know the family? I lived there for a long time. I, I worked in the media myself for over 15 years for the local radio and television station there. And um, I just knew everybody there. I went to a lot of the uh, functions, uh, the uh, business after hours, so on and so forth. And then there again, my daughter went to school with Bo. He was a couple of years younger than her, but... Everybody, you know, knew everybody in the in the in the valley. So um, I just I just knew them. I mean, tell me a little bit about the family. I mean, from what you know, from you know, you know, your daughter going to school with Bo and you living there for a long time. What what were the Bergdals like? The Bergdals are very down to earth, average country people. Um, James, the housewife, uh, Bo, it was in the construction field. He, uh, they're just good people. They just uh, go to work every day, average uh, country people. So you said he uh, was a construction worker. Uh, did you ever read the article that Michael Hastings published called America's Last Prisoner of War? Did you, did you ever read that? The father said he worked for the UPS for 28 years. So was that, is that not the case then? No, he worked for the UPS, but... He started in the construction field with oh, okay. everybody else. That's how I knew him. All right, I just wanted to clarify on that. Okay. Yeah, and, that's absolutely correct, yes. And were the, was the family at all religious in any kind of way? Were they very extreme in any kind of religion? You know, I don't think so, and I really don't know, but I don't think so. I think they were just... And when did you notice, or were you still there, when the father began learning Pashtun and started growing out that, you know, that Taliban-like beard? When did that start happening? Well, I gotta tell you this, um, now, and this is a fact. Uh, when that, when Bo was captured, of course, the whole valley was devastated. We all got together and we put yellow ribbons around the trees and the posts all throughout the valley for, you know, wanting Bo to come home. There was posters everywhere, planted everywhere, until the day that, that Bo was brought home. Well, it was approximately, I want to say, uh, six months afterwards, uh, Bob decided, just like any other father, I decided to grow his beard and grow his hair, and, and he was going to let it grow until his son was brought home. It's as simple as that. There was no altercation. There was nothing about that. He just wanted to do that until his son came home, and that's what he did. He grew his hair and his, and his beard. And as far as him speaking Arabic, I think he wanted to learn the language because I think they went over there to Afghanistan and he wanted to speak it. And he is an intelligent man, so um, he learned it. So you said his father went over there? You know, it, it seems to me like they went over to Afghanistan, but don't quote me, or went over there to the Middle East. I'm not sure. It's just with my experience, you know, you know I was in the Army and uh, Pashtun is not a very easy language to learn and it's one of those languages if you don't have someone to talk to every day and you're not able to, you know, converse with someone, it's hard to keep that dialect. And he, he 
was able to speak so freely and so almost just like he'd been doing it for so long. I, that's what I found to be a little odd. Really? Well, you know, I can't, I can't answer that. I just know that, that um, I think that they were going to do everything they could to get their son home. I don't think that there was any, um, any, any alterca- any bad altercation to the whatever about that. That's just my my taking on it. And, and um, as far as I'm speaking Arabic, you know, I I think it's like anybody else that wanted to learn a language. Um, maybe it came the time that he wanted to talk to those people, or or you know wanted to to learn the language. I you know I. I don't know. You know, I, I lived up there for a long time, and you know, we're, we're just simple people. We, I, I just don't think that Blaney and Bob uh, are bad people or or anything. I just think that their son went over there to war. I think he was just, you know, he wanted to go over there to serve his country, and he was caught up in this chaos of war. And I think that was more, more or less. I think he was brainwashed by those. Afghanistan people. I think that he was scared. And, uh, he was never going to see his family again. I think he was going to do what he had to do, and, and I think he was a pawn, and so on and so forth. I, I just really don't think anything more like that. Well, during the time that he was a POW, did you ever have, you know, did you ever talk to his parents at all? I know Bo was writing a lot of emails back to his uh, family. You know, in one of the emails, he he said that he was ashamed to be American. You know, did you ever have any chance to talk to the the mother or father oh. about a lot of those emails he was sending home? No, they wouldn't talk to the media, and they wouldn't talk to anybody about anything. And they so, really try, they really tried to stay out of the limelight every every which way they could because um, you know they just didn't want want. To, well, how want do you fe- how do you feel about the way that Bo is being portrayed now in the media in the mainstream media? You know, the fact that they're saying, is he a hero? Is he a deserter? How do you feel about that? You know, I, I, I don't think he's a deserter. I just, like I told you, I think he, I think he was just a scared uh, young man that went over there to, and was caught up in the war. And I think he just, uh, I think he, uh, you know, they say that he was trying to divert and trying to leave. Uh, who knows what he was trying to do? Maybe, he, maybe he just wanted to go for a walk. Maybe he wanted to just get get out of there, uh, and he got caught, and 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 there you go. Uh, he was just innocent, a pawn. He he didn't know what he was doing. Now, did and, you have did you have a chance to watch the interviews that when uh, the parents went to the White House and spoke to the president, and also yesterday Bob did an hour long interview as well live? Did you have a chance to watch those? Yes, yes, I did. And what did you think about those? Well, I don't know what to think about those, to be quite honest. I don't know. I mean, I mean I, my feeling on the whole thing, I think it's a, I think it's a, um, um, on my part, I think Obama, I think he's just doing this to make him look good. <laughs> I don't think it's right what, what he was doing. I don't, I don't think it's right at all. I think, I think he's using the, uh, Bo and his family to make him look good. And how so? How That's do you think that? How do you think that he's doing that? How's the spin on that? Well, you know, for years I mean, that Bo was gone, and uh, nobody really in the media, nobody really said anything about Bo. Only up here in the in the, in the Idaho area, and then we kept saying bring Bo home, and you know the. The, the media would, would get a hold of it a little bit and, and, and play on it, and that was it. But for years, nothing was said about Bo. And then all of a sudden, all of a sudden, you know, Bo's released. And he's being accused of all this. And, and sure, you know, those those terrorists, they're, they're terrible people. There's no doubt about it. Well, in 2010, there was a article that said that Bo had converted to Islam, and this is what the Taliban say, and that he had taught them how to make explosive devices, and that he had changed his name to Abdullah. Do you know anything about that as well? Did you ever hear the parents talk no. about that? No. Like I said, the parents didn't talk about anything about that. And as far as that goes, yeah, he probably he probably was forced into doing that. That's my thoughts on it. I don't think he was... Um, Do you think um, that uh, Bob, the father, uh, converted to Islam as well? No. No? I don't. 
All right, Susan, well, thanks for being on here. Do you have anything else you'd like to add? Anything else you'd like to say about this story? I think the Bo, it, I think Bo, like there again, I think Bo is just being used as a pawn. I think he, I think he stepped into something that he didn't know what he was getting into. And, and by the time he was there and he was caught, it was too late. And he had to, I mean, if anybody was going to be caught in a situation like that, I think, I think he'd do probably the same thing that he, he had to do. And, and he got to come home and, and that, because I know that he thought he never was going to see his parents again, his family, his friends, or his home. I think he's just scared. Once again, thank you, Susan, for being here and share, sharing your story with us. I appreciate it a lot. Thanks for being on InfoWars. Oh, yeah. Thanks a lot. All right. Stay tuned. Weeknight, 7 p.m. Central. Also, if you like the news, please make sure you go to prisonplanet.tv. Your username and password can be shared with up to 10 people. This has been the InfoWars Nightly News.